All right, good morning, everyone. So uh, today we'll continue our conversation that we set up on Monday, which was, again, bringing us to the 1800s, at least the late 1800s, and the realization that Ampere's Law had to be modified. So there's multiple different ways that we have brought this up. So the first way was that Maxwell noticed that they're not completely symmetric, i.e. there would be a complete symmetry between Faraday's Law and Ampere's Law if a certain term existed. And then the other way we actually pointed this out was to look at a parallel plate capacitor saying that here we have current coming in, we have current leaving, but in the gap in between the parallel plate capacitor, there's no physical charge moving, which means there is no actual physical current moving. So the question is, <clears throat> why do I have current coming in and current going out? Because if I took a wire and I simply cut a wire, I would kill my circuit because there's no closed circuit, so nothing can actually carry through. So, Question here is again, why do I actually have physical current passing through? And one more reason that we didn't talk about last time, I'm going to talk about now. So another reason we can see that Ampere's law is actually incomplete is if we consider, show you a picture instead of me drawing it, because it always works out better that way. So if I consider again my parallel plate capacitor, so here again I have current coming in, I have currents leaving, I have only an electric field on the inside. Well, Ampere's law would tell me that what? If I drew a path. So let's say here, this is the area at which I have current penetrating. So this is the loop at which I'm integrating over. So let's call this loop one, or at least path one. So here I would integrate along here. I would then look at the current, which is passing through this cross-sectional area, which in this case is equal to the current, which is moving through, which means in this case, Ampere's law would say that the closed loop integral V.VA, or sorry, DL, is equal to mu naught times this current. But if instead I took that same loop here, but I extended this portion of the area into here, so basically this bulging surface instead. So instead of looking at this surface area here, I'm looking at the surface area then of the bulging portion. In that case, my closed loop integral of B dot DL is equal to zero. Because in this case, the bulging surface goes in between the plates, which means there is no current passing through the area of the bulging surface, which means I get zero. So in this case, Ampere's law would tell me then for the two different configurations, and in this case, I would have simply mu naught times i, and this one would be equal to zero. Because this one is through the flat area, and this one is through the bulging area. But the flat area, I actually have i worth of current passing through it, where in the bulging area, I have zero currents because it's inside of the plates, which means that there is a contradiction. It can't be both mu naught i and zero simultaneously. So this is a contradiction. So basically all of these things together imply to us then that Ampere's law is non-sufficient. It is not complete. There is something which is missing. So that something which is missing is a modification which is done by Maxwell. So let's talk about it here. So let's go back to our picture. So let's say here are my plates. Actually, I'll go back to the original picture instead of drawing it again. So here's my plates. So what I have going on here is I have current coming in, I have currents leaving, and then I have my parallel plate. So my parallel plate is gaining charge over time. Okay. So here we can say then that what? The amount of charge that's building up onto this plate is simply then Q. Now what I also know is if I have a parallel plate here, that means there's a potential difference of V across them, and they're separated by a distance of D, what I also know is that the charge is simply equal to the capacitance of the capacitor times the potential difference across them. Okay, which means that if I write this out, I then have Q is equal to C times B. Now C, since this is a parallel plate capacitor, we know that that's equal to epsilon naught times the area divided by D. And we also know the potential difference is equal to the electric field times the distance between the two. So if I put these together, this is going to be epsilon naught times the area divided by the distance times the electric field times the distance. Those two distances are going to cancel. So this is going to be equal to epsilon naught times the electric field times the area. Well, what's electric field times area? What do we call that? Something we've seen many times. We've seen the electric field times the area. We've also seen the magnetic field times the area. So what do we call that? That is the electric flux. 
right? So basically, what this says then is what? If I think about the charge in terms of the capacitance, well, the charge that's building up in this plate is simply equal to epsilon naught times the electric flux between the plates. Now, what I also know is that the rate at which this charge is building up on the plate has to be equal then to the current which is coming in. Because as the current is bringing in charge, this charge then is going to build up at the plate at the same exact rate at which current is being brought onto it by the current which is moving. Right? Remember that current is simply the rate of change of charge. So if I take this guy and I now take its derivative, so I look at the time rate of change of the charge, that's equal to epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the electric flux. But I know this is equal to the current which is being delivered by the battery. <clears throat> so what that means is if this is current being brought by the battery, that has to be equal to the time rate of change of the charge, but that's equal to epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the electric flux. That means that epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the electric flux must also basically be a current, which is what we call the displacement current. So this thing here is defined as the displacement curve. So this answers our original question. So the original question was, why do we still have curves going across the gap if there's no physical charges which are being passed through the gap? Well, the answer is I have a time dependent electric flux. That time dependent electric flux, because my charge here is increasing over time as I'm bringing more charge to it. So that means the electric field is also increasing over time, which means the electric flux is increasing over time, which means that electric flux acts exactly like a current. Even though it's not a physical current because there's no actual charge being carried from the positive plate to the negative plate. So it's not a physical current, but it acts directly like a current. This is what we call the displacement current. Which means that we now have to modify Ampere's law to write Maxwell Ampere's law. Which now says that the closed loop integral of the magnetic field dotted by the differential length is then equal to mu naught times the regular current plus the displacement current. Okay. Now, one thing to note about this is one of these two will exist at a time, not both of them. Which means that you'll have one or the other, but not both. Okay. So going back to our picture, which means that if I was drawing my closed loop integral here, the only thing that exists in this portion of the wire is the physical current. If I draw my closed loop integral in between the planes, the only thing that exists between the plates is the displacement current. And then if I draw my closed loop here, the only thing that exists here, again, is the physical current. So I'm going to either have either the physical current or the induced or the displacement current, not both of them simultaneously through the same loop. Okay. So when I'm looking at Maxwell Ampere's law, I'm going to have one or the other. So we will have either I or I D, right? but not both at the same time. So not both in the same loop. So this was the modification that Maxwell applied to Ampere's law, which said that it wasn't actually complete with just the currents, but we needed something else that actually acted like the currents as well, and that is our displacement currents. So if I write it in full glory detail, the right-hand side becomes mu naught times I plus epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the electric flux. So this is the, what we call the displacement current. So again, it's not a real current because there's no change in charge. My charge is not changing because I'm not having charge go from one plate to the other plate. Well, what is changing is the electric flux and as the electric flux changes, that acts like a current. So this is what we call the displacement current. And we'll talk more about this in a minute. So let's use this and let's do some examples. Let's see. 
So the first one we're going to look at says we have a 30 picofarad air gapped capacitor has circular plates of area 100 centimeters square. It is charged by a battery which has 70 volts and it passes through a wire which has two ohms worth of resistance. So <clears throat> at this time we want to know at the instant when the battery is connected to the electric field or sorry connected to the circuit the electric field between the plates is changing at the greatest rate. So it just means if I had a switch, I close the switch when the original current is equal to zero, I'm now going to have the maximum change in the electric field. So DE dt is going to be changing the greatest. So I don't want to know at this instant at t is equal to zero, what is the current being brought into the plates or current in between the plates? Same question. Uh, the rate at which the electric field is changing between the plates and then determine the magnetic field between the plates. So these are all the things that we want to know. So let's draw some pretty pictures. So let's say here are my plates, okay? And I have this guy is attached here. So I have what currents coming in at t is equal to zero. So this is all happening at t is equal to zero. And then in this direction, I have current coming out. So what I want to know is equivalently either what is the current being brought into the plates or what is the displacement current which is moving across the plates. They have to be the same because it has to be continuous all the way across because I know this current here is equal to this current, which means that current has to be the same as them. So either way I want to look at it is the same. Good. So let's part A. So part A, I want to know what is I. So let's look at that guy. So there's two ways I can do this. Either I could calculate the displacement current using the fact that that. Well, we know that the charge across a capacitor is given by the capacitance times the EMF times one minus E to the minus T divided by tau, which means here we can calculate then dQ dt, which has to be equal to the displacement current. But in this case, we want to evaluate it at time is equal to zero. So first we would do the derivative and then evaluate all of this at T is equal to zero. That's one way we can do it. The other way we can do it is we can say that what? When I originally hook up my battery to the wire, the capacitor has no charge onto it, which means the flow it has to, the current has to flow through my circuit as if the capacitor wasn't there, which means it has to be purely dictated by the resistor. So the other way I can do it is I can say, well, my current by Ohm's law is simply equal to the EMF divided by the resistance. So this one is the current which is being brought in. This one is the displacement current. But again, the displacement current has to be equal to the current which is coming in. Which way sounds easier? Ohm's law, good. So let's use Ohm's law. So we know this is equal to simply 70 uh, volts divided by two ohms. So this is then equal to 35 amps. So the current which is coming in, which is also equal to the displacement current, is simply equal to 35 meters. Nice. Are we okay? Now, the next thing is, part B then says, okay, what is the rate of change of electric field in between the plates? So what's happening is in here, I have an electric field which points in this direction. So I want to know what is the rate at which this electric field is changing? Well, we now know that the current that we just found, which is equal to the displacement currents, is equal to epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the electric flux. So this is then equal to epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the integral of E dot dA. Now, in our case, let's go back to here. Let's choose our dA in the same direction as the electric field. So this is my dA. So my dot product becomes simply one. So that's going to be the magnitude of the electric field times the magnitude of A. And what do we know is true about the electric field inside of parallel plates? Is it position dependent? No, it's constant. It points in one direction. So in this case, we know that E is independent of dA because it's simply a constant. It's time dependent, but it's not position dependent, which means that comes outside of the integral, which means this is going to be simply equal to epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the electric field times the area. Here, what's changing is simply the electric field. 
the area is not changing. I'm not changing the size of the plates. All I'm changing is the electric field. So this is then going to be epsilon naught times the area times the time rate of change of the electric field. Which means then that the time rate of change of the electric field is then equal to the displacement current or the current divided by epsilon naught times the area. Plug in our numbers. So this is going to be equal to 35 amps divided by 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 times 100 centimeters squared, which we're going to have to put into meters. But after we do that, what we should find then is that this works out to be 4 times 10 to the positive 14th volts per meter. So this is our magnitude per second. Per second volts per meter per second. <clears throat> That's the rate at which the electric field is changing. Okay. Say bomb. Say bomb. Part C. So part C is now saying, what is the magnetic field inside of the plates? Good. So let's look at this. So let me now draw a front view and let's talk about what's going on. So here's my front view of my plates. So here I have circular plates. Here's my circular plates. And let's just say for now, this has a radius of R0. Let's call that R0. I don't want to confuse it with resistance of R. So what's happening is I have a ma or electric field which is pointing at us. So let's say this is my electric field. Now, the way that this works is pretty much exactly the same way that Faraday's law works. So the way that Faraday's law said was that if the electric flux, or sorry, the magnetic flux was getting bigger, then the system itself had to induce a magnetic field in the opposite direction to counteract the change of that increasing magnetic flux. Which means in that case, if this electric field was getting, or if this was a magnetic field, if this was getting bigger, we'd have to induce a magnetic field into, and then our fingers would curl around in the direction of the electric field. Now, this one is a little bit different because notice that there's a positive sign instead of a negative sign. Which means that since it's a positive sign instead of a negative sign, the positive sign means that it actually wants to induce in the direction of change. So here we have something similar to Lenz's law, except the fact is that this one now wants to enhance the change as opposed to, I should say, as opposed to oppose, opposite of opposing the change. So this is your friend that says, let's get drunk and jump off the bridge. And you say, hell yeah. Right? So you're going to amp each other up. This is opposite of the Faraday's law who wants to pull you back. Let's maybe not jump off the bridge. Let's jump off the curb. At least that way we can break our ankle instead of die. Life is good, right? So this works exactly the same way. So what this says is if my electric field in this case is pointing out in this direction, it's increasing over time because that was a positive change. Then what I have to do is now induce another electric field in the same direction as this field because I want to enhance the change, not hinder the change. So if I do that, then I have to point my thumb in the direction of the induced electric field. My fingers then curl around in the direction of the induced magnetic field, which means that my magnetic field is going to be circular pointing in this direction. This is the magnetic field which is going to be induced. Right. <clears throat> so here we want to know at this radius of little r, what is the magnetic field which is induced? So to do that, we now have Ampere Maxwell's law, which says that the closed loop integral of the magnetic field dotted by the differential length is then equal to mu naught times epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the electric flux. Now, in this case, let's deal with the left-hand side first. Here, let's go ahead and draw our Empyrean loop. So our Empyrean loop is going to point in exactly the same direction as the magnetic field. This guy's going to point this way. So this is going to be my DL. 
which means that this dot product can become simply the magnitude of B times the magnitude of DL. But everywhere across DL, B is simply a constant, which means it comes outside of the integral. So this becomes B times the closed loop integral of DL. But the closed loop integral of DL is simply the length of DL, which means that that's equal to 2 pi r. So the left-hand side is going to be B times 2 pi r, the same thing we would have gotten with regular Ampere's law. The right-hand side, as we now know, is equal to mu naught times epsilon naught times the area times then the time rate of change of the electric field. So that's just the displacement current that we did in that previous part. So good. So from here, now the question becomes, what area is this? Is this the entire area of the plates, or is it the area in the green loop? Which area is it now? So is it the entire area using R0, or is it going to be little r. Which area is it going to be? So remember, the question is, where is this flux going through? As far as this circle is concerned, do I care about the flux through the entire plates or only the loop that I drew? Which area do I care about? <clears throat> Go for it, Dylan. It's the loop that I drew. That's right. So the only loop I care about here is the area of this that I drew here. Good. So in this case, I'm now going to have B times 2 pi R is then equal to mu naught epsilon naught pi R squared times the rate of change of the electric field. Good. So this pi here is going to cancel this pi. This R is going to cancel one of those. So finally, I get the magnetic field then is equal to mu naught epsilon naught R divided by 2 times then the time rate of change of the electric field. And again, I want to know all of this at simply T is equal to 0. Now, in this case, this is the magnetic field that anywhere inside of the plates. Now, of course, I didn't tell you where I was looking at the plates. So the best thing we can do here to actually calculate the number is we can find the maximum value of the magnetic field. The maximum value of the magnetic field is going to be when little r is equal to r0, the radius of the plates. So here, we can then say that B max occurs at r is equal to r0, which means this is going to be mu naught epsilon naught r0 divided by 2 times the time rate of change of the electric field evaluated at t is equal to 0. Plug in my numbers. What I get in this case then is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 4 teslas. 1.2 times 10 to the minus 4 Teslas. So this is my maximum magnetic field at time is equal to zero. Now, what will happen though is as time goes on, the rate of change of the electric field will get smaller, which means that this maximum magnetic field will also get smaller over time. Until eventually, as time goes off to infinity, the currents will then go to zero, the charge will go to the maximum, the time rate of change of the electric field will go to zero, which means this magnetic field will also go to zero. So what ends up happening is as T goes to zero, B max will also go to zero because DE DT will go to zero because the current goes to zero. Remember, as the capacitor becomes fully charged, the current exponentially decreases and will eventually go to zero as time goes to infinity. Let's do another example. The next one says, suppose that a parallel plate capacitor has circular plates of radius 30 millimeters and a plate separation of five millimeters. And suppose that a sinusoidal potential difference with a maximum value of 150 volts and a frequency of 60 hertz 
is applied across the plates so that our potential as a function of time looks like this. So it's 150 volts times sine of 2 pi times 60 hertz times the time. So here we want to find what is B max at R is equal to capital R, so at the perimeter of the plates. Uh, and then it wants to find the value of, so that's just that, right? And then the next part is it wants us to plot B max. So anywhere inside the plates to outside of the plates. So we're going to have to find it both inside the plates, outside the plates, and then we'll evaluate B max. That way we can plot the entire thing. Okay. Great. So let's talk about this. So let's say again, here are my plates. So here are my plates, circular plates. I got current coming in and I got a potential difference across here, V, which is sinusoidal, which is, I'm just going to call this as V zero sine of two pi times the frequency times time. We'll plug our numbers later. And we also know that this is gapped across here. So this is our distance D. <clears throat> Good. So this is our side view. Let's draw a front view. So here is my plates. It's our front view. So remember that, again, the electric field is equal to the potential divided by the distance between the two, which means that my electric field is also sinusoidally changing. So what this means then is our electric field is actually going to switch back and forth, increase and decrease in magnitude, which means that this thing is going to be pointing in different directions all the time. I'm just going to arbitrarily say at this stage it's pointing this way. So good. What will happen? So from here, since this is a sign, what we know is that t is equal to zero, this thing is equal to zero, so there is no potential. As time increases then, my electric field is going to point this way, and it's going to increase which means that what? As this thing is increasing, my induced electric field then is going to point in this direction, which means that my magnetic field is going to point this way. Now notice when it reaches V0, it's then going to decrease in size, which means that this guy is going to be getting smaller. This guy is going to point in the opposite direction because it's going to enhance the change, which means if it's getting smaller, it's going to point this way, which means the direction of the magnetic field is going to switch. So the magnetic field direction will also be sinusoidally changing. Okay with this? So at this moment here, I'm just assuming that this E is increasing so that my electric field has to be in the same direction. So my magnetic field is going to switch this way. So let's think about the left-hand side. Left-hand side, again, is I'm going to draw my amperian loop. My amperian loop is going to point in the same direction as my magnetic field. So that's when I do Ampere's law. The left-hand side is going to become the closed loop integral of B dot DL is then simply equal to B times 2 pi R, where this thing is at a radius of R. OK? And the overall plates have a radius of Simple and simple. Okay. Now the right-hand side says that this is mu naught times the induced or the displacement current. So the right-hand side is going to be mu naught epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the electric field times the area. Now here I'm doing the same thing when I do it with the flux because again I'm inside of a parallel plate capacitor the electric field is still spatially constant anywhere inside of a parallel plate capacitor. It is time dependent but it is spatially independent which is why my flux is simply E times A. Okay so the right hand side then becomes finally mu naught epsilon naught times the area times the time rate of change of the electric field. Again, what we said on the previous page, though, is the electric field is the same thing as the potential divided by the distance. So let's replace that. So this is going to be equal to mu naught, epsilon naught, area, divided by distance, times the time rate of change of the potential. Because the distance between the plates is constant. It's not increasing or decreasing. Only the potential is sinusoidally changing. 
is okay. So this is now mu naught and epsilon naught area divided by distance times the time rate of change of v0 sine of 2 pi ft. Running out of real estate. Now, as far as this is concerned, d0 is a constant, so that also comes outside of the derivative. I don't have to care about that. What's the derivative of a sine? Cosine, is it positive or negative? Positive, but So in this case, I get a cosine, and then I get the derivative of the inside, so I get a two pi frequency on the outside. Okay. So let's put all this stuff together. So finally, what I get is B times two pi R is equal to mu naught epsilon naught area divided by the distance uh, times V zero times two pi times the frequency times cosine of two pi times the frequency times the time. This is then my magnetic field. It was okay. Now, so now, since I want to plot eventually the magnetic fields from anywhere from zero all the way up to 10 centimeters, and I know the radius of the plates is only 30 millimeters. What that means then is I now have to consider the magnetic field on the inside and outside. All right. So let's first look at the case A, or one, when R is less than capital R. So in this case, that's simply the picture that we drew. Right? Here I have R is less than little, or little R is less than big R. Now in this case, the area, as Dylan already told us, the area that we care about for the flux is simply the area contained within inside of the circle, which means in this case, we then have that this is B times two pi R is equal to mu naught epsilon naught A. A in this case is pi times little r squared divided by D times two pi frequency times V zero times then cosine of two pi frequency times time. <coughs> So I know kill off terms, this pi is going to cancel this pi, this r is going to cancel one of these r's, which means then that finally my magnetic field is going to be mu naught epsilon naught r divided by 2d times 2 pi times the frequency times v0 times cosine of 2 pi times the frequency times time. <coughs> So this is the magnetic field anywhere inside of the place. Now, the next thing we want to know is what is the maximum value that this thing can be? Meaning that this cosine does what? It oscillates between one and negative one, right? Which means what's the biggest that cosine can be? So what's the biggest it can be? I already told you. It oscillates between one and negative one. What's the biggest thing it be? One. <laughs> so B max then is going to correspond to when cosine here is simply equal to one. That's going to be the maximum value of the magnetic field at that point. So then B max will be all of this stuff. But cosine will be one. So this is the maximum value of the magnetic field. Okay? So all I'm doing is setting cosine one. That's it. So this guy just has to equal. Okay? What about on the outside? On the outside, case number two, 
little r is greater than capital R. So let's draw our picture. So the only difference now is that DL is now going to be out here. Right? This is now my DL. My magnetic field is still going to point in the same direction. Oops, should have a different color. Blue. There we go. So my magnetic field is still doing this. This is still B. DL is still pointing in the same direction. Now for this DL, what area do I care about now? Do I care about this little r? So do I care about little r, this entire area here, or do I only care about the area of the plates? So where is the flux now? So is the flux all the way out to here, or is it only contained with inside of the plates? Only between the plates, right? Which means that now the area I care about now corresponds to capital R instead of little r, because all the magnetic field, or sorry, all the electric field is only contained with inside of the plates themselves. So for this case, the area I care about now is equal to pi times capital R squared instead. So now I have B times two pi R is equal to mu naught epsilon naught area times capital R squared divided by D times two pi times the frequency times the peak potential times cosine of two pi frequency times time. So here, the only thing that's gonna cancel now is simply that pi. Capital R is gonna stay. So this then becomes mu naught epsilon naught R squared divided by two R D times two pi F times V zero times cosine of two pi frequency times time. <clears throat> Again, what I want is B max. So what's the value of cosine to make that B maximum? One. One. Good. <laughs> Same thing as before. So finally, for the outside, we have B max then is mu naught epsilon naught r squared divided by two r d times two pi times the frequency times v zero. Now, before I do part A, let's do part B. So part B says they wanted us to plot. Well, let's go back to here. So this thing says, if we're plotting it as a function of a radius, all of this stuff here is constant except for R. So what this means then is anywhere inside of the planes, my magnetic field that has to linearly grow is R. Until I get to the point where little r is equal to capital R, then when I get outside of there, this one says now that everything here is now constant except for one over R. So my magnetic field now decreases as one over R as I get to the outside. So if I do this plot, all it says is B max then has a function of position. Now increases linearly until I get to R. And then after that, it has to decrease as one over R. So this is one over R, this is a capital R which means the maximum value that B max is going to be is when R is equal to R, which is part A. So part A, this was part B, says that we want B max evaluated at R is equal to capital R. <coughs> Whichever one of these I choose gives me the same answer because here if I evaluate this at capital R, capital R here is gonna cancel one of those which leaves it R on top. Or if I use the other one, this just becomes capital R which is the same answer doesn't matter which one I use. So in this case, this is just gonna be mu naught epsilon naught R, capital R, divided by two D times two, two pi F times V zero. Plug in my numbers. What I get in this case then is this works out to be about 1.2 times 10 to, or sorry, 1.9 times 10 to the minus 12 Teslas. Never got the minus 10, that's fine. 1.9 times 10 to the minus 12. Teslas. So this is the maximum value, the actual, yeah, maximum value of the magnetic field at R is equal to R, which is the absolute maximum value that that guy is going to be. Whew, that was hot. Okay. Everyone's okay? Expect something like this on the fifth exam. This will be the hardest problem on the fifth exam. Everything else will be nice and easy. Stay bon. Stay
and on. So this brings us to, again, late 1800s. And now we can now finally write down the whole point of this class, which is Maxwell's equations. So Maxwell's equations are one, Gauss's law. So Gauss's law says that the closed surface integral of the electric field dotted by the differential area is equal to the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. Number two, which is also Gauss's law, but for magnetism, closed surface integral of the magnetic field dotted by the differential area is zero. Three, Faraday's law, which says that the closed loop integral of the electric field dotted by the differential length is equal to minus the time rate of change of the integral of the magnetic field dotted by the differential area. And finally, Maxwell Ampere, which says that the closed loop integral of the magnetic field dotted by the differential length is equal to mu naught times the current plus the displacement current. These now are collectively Maxwell's equations. Seems a little shitey at first that what Maxwell gets his name for everybody else's accomplishments because all he did was add that. But again, as we talked about last time, that's actually not all he did. He also not only unified all these things together, because again, these were all considered to be separate things with two separate theories, electric theory and magnetic theory. So we actually showed that they were actually all unified into one beautiful theory, which is what's known as Maxwell's equations. And he used them to predict light. So he actually did a lot. He didn't just add that one little term. For a long time, I just thought it was kind of, thought it was yeah, really bad that he got his name on everybody else's work. But once I finally understood that he actually did all that other stuff, I was okay with it. So <clears throat> nothing I could do to change it anyway. So like now, these beautiful four equations, along with the Lorentz force, now explains everything about electricity and magnetism. Everything you ever wanted to do in electricity and magnetism, plus the Lorentz force, which says that the total force is equal to the electric force plus the magnetic force, is everything for electricity and magnetism. Everything you ever wanted to do is contained here. Now, <clears throat> to go a little bit further, let's now talk about the reduction of light. So the main thing, or the main contribution that Maxwell gave was that he actually predicted light. And where light actually comes from is an interplay between these two, Faraday's law and Maxwell's Ampere's law. So it's actually these two combined without this portion, which actually predicts light. So the reason for that, again, is this negative sign here. It's the fact that the magnetic field causes things to come back, meaning it wants to bring it back to equilibrium, while this one here has a positive sign, which means it wants to push it away from equilibrium, okay? So if you think about harmonic oscillation, the reason that this thing goes under harmonic oscillation is the fact that there's a restoring force. That restoring force always pulls it back towards equilibrium, but there's also something pushing it away because if it came back to equilibrium, it would simply stop. But there has to be something pushing it away, which in this case is the inertia. The fact that it has too much momentum carrying through, that's basically the role that this guy plays. This guy pushes it away from equilibrium. This one brings it back to equilibrium. And remember that a wave is simply harmonic oscillation, but it's harmonic, harmonic oscillation in both time and space. Okay? So it's the interplay between Faraday's law and the modified version of Ampere's law, which actually predicts light. This is where light actually comes from. So light, as we know from what we talked about previously in the semester, is actually, this one I want, oh, yeah, right. an oscillating electric and magnetic wave. Remember, this is light. So what's happening here, again, is that the, which one's which? So the electric field is trying to move away, but as the electric field increases, the magnetic field is trying to decrease through the opposite thing in which the electric field is doing. So as the electric field increases, the magnetic field starts to try to decrease it, which is why it increases and then comes back to the equilibrium position. So what light actually is, it's an electric field oscillating, a magnetic field oscillating, but they're oscillating perpendicular to each other. We'll see why that's more in a minute. 
But since this is simply a wave, that means it has a wavelength, and the distance between the peaks of the electric field or the peaks between the magnetic field, it has a frequency, has all the good stuff that we talked about when we did waves. So now we have to remember all that wave crap we talked about 100 years ago. So good. So this is what Maxwell predicted. So he predicted that we now have lights. So how does this work? So let's talk about the way that this actually works. Now I'm not gonna derive the wave equation for you because you're gonna get basically nothing out of it. And I'm gonna talk a whole bunch of math for a long time and you're just gonna go, eyes are gonna glaze over and you have no idea what I'm talking about. And will be useful to you basically anyways. Involves a whole bunch of Calc 3 stuff that I just don't wanna get into at this stage. So for those of you in Calc 3, hopefully you're actually learning this because I don't usually teach this at this university, which kind of annoys me, but it deals with divergence theorem, green theorem, all these good things which have, you may or may not have heard of in Calc 3 at this time. So I'm gonna ignore that. So what we're gonna talk about is an actual real life application of this, which is called an antenna. So how does an antenna create electric light, basically? How does it create a radio signal? So an antenna, which we're gonna talk about is actually known as a dipole antenna, looks something like this. So what I'm gonna do is connect here an AC generator. So here's my AC generator, and I'm gonna connect that to two poles, which are gonna be my antenna. So <clears throat> what'll happen is an AC generator creates AC potential, which means it creates AC currents. So what's gonna happen is, as my AC current's gonna go through here, let's say at T is equal to zero, this has no charge because there's no current flowing through. This also has no charge. So at T is equal to zero, we're gonna let the charge flow, let the current flow. So what'll happen is, this side is gonna become slowly positively charged. And this side then is going to become negatively charged. So I got a current running in which means in this case, I have current flowing in this direction. So here I have current going this way, but I also have an electric field. My electric field is gonna point from the positive plate to the negative plate. So my electric field is gonna do something like this. So this is gonna be my electric field. Now, as we just talked about, as the positive charges here are increasing, meaning the current is increasing, then the size of the magnetic field, or sorry, the size of the electric field is going to increase which means that if I plotted the electric field as a function of time, this thing starts off at zero, but then slowly starts to increase because the amount of charge on these antenna are increasing until it reaches its maximum value. Once it reaches the maximum value, it's gonna turn around and then it's going to start to decrease. So eventually go to zero and then it's gonna switch directions which means that the positive charges are gonna end up here, negative charges are gonna end up on here, so it's gonna point in the opposite direction. Same thing, it's gonna increase until it reaches its maximum and then decrease and go to zero, which means that my electric field then is going to sinusoidally oscillate. It's gonna do something like this. The magnetic field, well, in this case, since current is going in this direction, I put my thumb in the direction of the current, curl towards the magnetic field, right? Right hand rule number one, which means on the right hand side here, my magnetic field is going into, let me use this color, into the board, right? So my magnetic field is doing this. But since this thing started off with zero current and the current is increasing over time, if I plotted the magnetic field as a function of time, this is gonna do the same thing. Right? It's gonna start off at zero, increase, 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 increase until it reaches its maximum, and then decrease, 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 go to zero, and then switch sides. Because right? now, once this side becomes positively charged, this side becomes negatively charged, the current is now going to point down in the opposite direction. So this thing is going to again increase, decrease, and then eventually go to zero. Which means that if I plot this guy, this guy is also sinusoidally changing. So what this tells us then, and by looking at this, is we're creating an electric field, we're creating a magnetic field. These two are perpendicular to each other because the electric field is only in this plane. Magnetic field is perpendicular to that. But not only are they perpendicular, but they're also in phase with each other. Meaning the phase of this wave here is exactly the phase as this wave here which means if I looked at the magnitude of the electric field, 
And this is going to be equal to E0 times some sine of then K. Let's say this is propagating in the Z direction. So let's write this as KZ uh, minus omega T. And then if I look at my magnetic field, this is also going to be some B0 times sine of KZ minus omega T. These two are exactly in phase with each other. So this guy and this guy are in phase. So the pure fact that the currents in the charge are changing over time, which means that they're accelerating over time, that then creates a electromagnetic wave. This is the way an antenna works. Now go a little bit further. The direction of the wave, which is propagating, is actually proportional to the cross product between the electric field and the magnetic field. And the way to see that is at this point here, my electric field is pointing in this direction. My magnetic field is inward. So if I put my fingers in the direction of the electric field and then I cross that by the magnetic field, my thumb then points in the direction of the propagation of the wave. So if my wave here is actually traveling in this direction and the direction is actually given by E cross B. So the direction at which the wave here is traveling is given by again, E cross B. It's proportional to that. So the velocity direction is proportional to E cross B. So antennas are actually kind of interesting because again, as this thing switches from one side to the other side, I actually create electric field lines in the opposite directions. And what ends up happening is I get an interaction between the electric field lines on the interior versus the electric lines which are given before. And what ends up happening is I actually create circles of electric field lines. So what happened is these electric field lines are pointing in this direction. And then at a later time, they're pointing in this direction. So these guys superimpose on top of each other, which actually creates these circular packets of electric field lines, which actually go outward. So you can see a little bit out here. So again, if I extend this guy down in here, these guys create these kind of circular loops, which are actually moving outward. Now, what'll happen is this antenna, which is this guy here, this is the top portion, the bottom portion would be here. <clears throat> As the wave moves further and further away, these circles get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually this thing's gonna be stretched out so far that this section in here is gonna look just like a straight line. By the time it gets out there, which is what we call the far field limits, these circular waves actually become what are called plane waves. So a plane wave just looks like a front like this, which is moving. But this happens as I get very far away from the antenna, which actually creates these plane waves. This is the way that the antenna actually works. Now, the other thing is when we talk about the light, light is a generic term for the entire electromagnetic spectrum. When most people think about light, they think about this little tiny portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is the visible light. But electromagnetic radiation goes all the way from zero frequency all the way up to basically infinite frequency, which means that it goes from infinite wavelength all the way down to zero wavelength. This is electromagnetic radiation. So most people think of light, they think of this, but it's actually everything. Low frequency, which basically means low energy or high wavelength, first off would be the radio waves. So for example, if you're listening to AM radio, you're listening to a very, very weak energy wave, but it has a ridiculously high wavelength. So let me, let me ask you a question. Anybody know why you don't have an antenna for an AM radio? So if you think about your car, right? You have a little tiny antenna on your car. That's for the FM radio. Why don't you have an antenna for an AM radio? I'll give you an answer. The energy of an AM radio, the frequency is smaller than that of an FM, which means the wavelength is bigger. Which means your car is actually the antenna. Because the size of an AM radio, that wavelength is about the size of your car, which means your entire car is actually the radio or the antenna for the AM radio. Another interesting fact is AM radio's wavelengths actually travel through the ground, not through the air. So you actually pick it up from your tires. 
FM, it's about the size of that, right? So basically for radio, it's about the size of your hand, if bigger, about the size of the building as well, depending on what you're talking about. Microwaves, which you use in your house, are anywhere between the size of your hand down to about the size of a pinhead. Uh, some millimeter, so you're talking about the size of a pinhead to about the hair of a person. Infrared is anywhere from a hair of a person to about the size of a single cell uh, molecule. Visible light is the size of a single cell molecule. Ultraviolet goes from a single cell molecule down to regular molecules. X-rays are from molecules all the way down to about the atom size and gamma rays are even higher than that. So again, when we talk about lights, we're talking about all of this stuff, not just visible light. So we'll pick this up tomorrow and start talking about more cool stuff about the lights. What's up, Dylan? Sorry, I was like, wow, what a class. <laughs> <laughs> They all showed up. <laughs> <laughs> you okay, Dylan? You had a question? In the, in the picture of the antenna, would the magnetic fields point out of the page in the bottom half? Well, it's still into the page on the bottom half because the current, no matter what, is going up. It's only when they switch directions, when the bottom one becomes positively charged and the top one becomes negatively charged, then the current would be going down in the opposite direction. And then the current. Okay, okay thank you. Is that it?